Hello, good morning. How are you? Okay. Good level of energy in the room. Fine. Okay, so today I'm going to continue with the presentation of my notes about chapters four, complete chapter four of Briggs and uh, Burke's The Social History of the Media, the second textbook. Uh, I will continue with some of chapter five, not all of it. Um, just a reminder that this week, week nine, will be the last week devoted to DocuWiki. I will complete my demonstration of this app between Wednesday and Friday. And you have the last digital assignment coming, which is described at the end of page nine. If the instructions are not clear enough, simply contact me. If you are one of the very few who still hasn't requested login credentials to work on the DocuWiki page, send me an email. I'll create a profile for you, send you your username and password. By the way, if you would like me to use a specific password of your choice, then please send me the password. The username will be standard for all students, the first name and the initial of the last name so that I can, when I look at the list of users, I can quickly identify each uh, student as far as the password, if you have a preference as long as your password is not password or one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, you can request one, okay? As usual, the idea for this digital assignment is for you to show, demonstrate an understanding of the coding associated with formatting and organizing a page in DocuWiki. You have to come up with some content that would warrant the use of such formatting and showcase what you've learned at the basic and intermediate level for this page. This will be the last assignment in this category. After that, you're supposed to devote your time to the final project, which will be based on one of these three uh, apps, knowledge apps, DocuWiki, Evernote, or Notion, and uh, we can talk more about the final project in the weeks to come, but at any point you can schedule a meeting or approach me with questions about it. This is the point where we stopped last week in reference to the notes on chapters four and five. We're going through cultural, social, and then technological changes that occurred in the last two centuries that have affected the society in general, the societies of many countries, especially Western countries, and then have also had an impact on the creation of digital media their use, their interface with general society, and in general, have led to what we now know as and define as a knowledge-based society or the knowledge industry. And we were talking about the effects of industrialization on European societies where industrialization was deployed initially during the 18th century. And it's interesting to note what other theories are, are being developed during that period prompted by these phenomena. So for example, Thomas Malthus establishes the foundation of the studies of population and population growth demographics. And his uh, thoughts about population growth is that it is in itself potentially dangerous and can lead, for example, either to negative effects such as famines or negative effects in 
directed outward, not inward, in, in uh, regards to the possibility of uh, war being caused by demographic expansion. And, and that theory will then be elaborated on even in the 20th century, so it's, it's not forgotten. And in reference to in the process of industrialization, the uh, most vocal and uh, one of the most famous critics of the phenomenon was Karl Marx, who spoke about alienation in reference to two aspects of the industrial or industrialized economy. One was that the profit generated by the workers in the factories was being alienated, meaning was taken from them unjustly, unfairly by the founder of the factory, by the manager, by the entrepreneur uh, that created the factory. And also besides this material alienation, alienation of material goods, of money, of value, he talked about mental alienation in reference to the debasing of the social role of the worker who becomes just an appendix to the system, is not empowered by the system at all. In fact, it is enslaved by the system. When he published the Communist Manifesto in collaboration with Engels in 1848, don't, don't forget that 1848 is also the year of revolutions in Europe, in many European countries, from Greece to Italy to uh, France and Germany, there are ins popular insurrections. When he published the manifesto, he emphasized class struggles as an engine of change in society, an, ele an, element, of, an element of tension. And this is uh, important because it reframed the analysis and the view of society altogether. The classes that people referred to before Karl Marx were different. Classes before that period were mostly, in most documents, the clergy, the aristocracy, the merchants or the professionals, the so-called bourgeoisie, and the people in general, the masses, whereas in Marx's view, the emphasis is placed entirely on two groups. One is the bourgeoisie, which is identified with anyone involved in entrepreneurship or anyone whose survival, whose um, earnings rely, depend on the system, the industrial system at the managerial level. And the proletariat are the laborers who have no power over the system itself and simply provide their physical labor, but they're completely at the mercy of the bourgeoisie. In Marx's view, this class struggle was in turn the origin of everything, including intellectual labor, including culture and literature that in his view, literature itself was mostly the expression of the interests of the bourgeoisie and the values of the bourgeoisie that kept the laborers without power. For a variety of reasons that we have explained how the industri industrialization affected um, the, the landscape, the air, uh, society in general, it is not surprising that you find this definition uh, from the period that democracy is the dismal science. Uh, sorry, that political economy, democracy is another section mentioned here, that political economy is the dismal science, meaning that whenever you study the economic structure of society, it's easier to point out at mistakes or problems that are intrinsic to the system than it is to find solutions. So it generates pessimism according to Malthus, who was in general a pessimist even in reference to population growth and 
the interaction between growth and resources needed to support any, a, a, a larger population, an increasing number of uh, people. Certainly, it is true that this criticism is the result of a deepened reflection on the fact that the new system, the new industrialized system, was eroding what used to be the domestic foundation of the traditional economic system. That is to say, traditional economic system that relied mostly on agriculture and marginally on commerce was heavily based on the involvement of the family within economic activities. And more on the family than on external or higher level of entrepreneurship and control and managerial control and all the power instead is, is shifted from the family. Of course, by family, you, depending on the society, you uh, refer to an extended family or a small community or a group, a shift from the family to a society where the individual is taken out of his social context and treated singularly just as an element, as a cogwheel into a machine that advances according to its own laws and rules that are outside the sphere of control of that individual. There is the beginning of a process that will continue in some countries into the 21st century. The shift from an emphasis on small community to larger urban areas. In every industrialized country, England first, then France, and to follow other European countries, and then throughout the 20th century and the 21st century, even developing country, you see people abandoning the small communities. In fact, you have to think that up to 200 years ago, most countries had a distribution of the population that was such that most of the population lived in places that had fewer than 20,000 people and oftentimes fewer than 5,000 people. So, and you really have to imagine what life was like for a relatively insulated and isolated community of 5,000 or, or less where everybody can know uh, each other. You can imagine the shift from this to uh, urban areas with millions of people and how it affected the structure of society or the relevance of the family, the extended family, the clan, etc. So there is a process of massification. The people who leave those small communities and move into London, Paris, Rome, etc. are massified, meaning they're just one in a million. They're not really included integrated into any kind of community where they gain a social dignity or a social role. And therefore, their social role is uh, reduced to just being part of the working population of the workforce in a factory. Volunteering is a new phenomenon, a modern phenomenon, which is which seems to be positive, it starts in Great Britain and then it extends into many countries. And usually you see this process as soon as a country is industrialized and heavily industrialized, you see an increase in volunteering. Why? Because there is the public perception that in this industrialized society, a lot of people are suffering, not just from poverty, but also from mental anguish. And therefore, there is a social reaction in an attempt to balance the situation, to restore stability in society by uh, uh, groups involved in volunteering activities to support materially and psychologically or spiritually those who are in distress. That's why it's not at all just a positive sign. It is uh, the consequence of how dire the situation is and how dramatic the effect is for those who uh, are in a better situation to witness the uh, uh, conditions, the low conditions of living of so many people in that kind of society. 
It is also the result of this, uh, aban uh, the, the, the abandoning of the small community where social support was part of the existence in a regular way. For example, when most countries were structured on small communities, people with mental disabilities were kept inside the community and supported by the system, right? Uh, in a village, in a small town, people knew who the people affected by mental disabilities were, and one way or the other, there were social interactions that kept a balance, that provided support, whereas in this massified society of the large urban areas, the people with mental disabilities are abandoned to themselves, and then you have the creation of mental hospitals. And then you have creation of institutions where those people are taken out of society and placed in a, a, essentially a, a kind of prison with limited therapy just to control their asocial or antisocial behavior because there is no social network that would shield them, that would facilitate their interactions with society. And again, this is something you see in Great Britain first, but you might, see, you might see it in other countries in the 20th century or even after the end of the 20th century. So some numbers, again, the purpose of these notes is so that you're not confused by the abundance of details, but some details are more telling than others. London, 1802, one twelfth of the British population lives in London. And, and that gives you a sense of the massification of the shift from the countryside to large urban areas. In 1851, one fifth of the population in Manchester had been born elsewhere, meaning that there was this sudden, quick migration into large industrial areas, Manchester being an industrial area. And the result, broken families, because there is a heavy reliance in this industrial system on child and female labor because essentially uh, children and women become simply an appendix to the machinery of the factory, repeating simple menial tasks, also very boring tasks, for eight, 10, often 12 hours a day. The media that uh, are responsible for the largest amount of influence in society are still books and magazines or journals. And within literature, you see the development that is not all of this is connected to the changes in society. You see the development of the roman, of the 19th century novel, which is not at all like the novels you read today, or most of the novels, 99% of the novels you, you read today. Most of the novels of today are just a film on page. If you look at the style, if you look at how the story is structured, it's like a film on the page that you can follow, whereas the 19th century novel is a social plan, is a social manifesto, is a kind of novel that has a lot of social and historical elements, and I provided some example in Zola for uh, France, Charles Dickens for England, Alessandro Manzoni for Italy, even though the, the book doesn't mention Manzoni because Burke's views are uh, often somewhat limited. All, uh, all of these writers produce novels that become bestsellers, are read by hundreds of thousands or millions or of, of people, and these, are, uh, these novels are like a symphony. They're very complex. They have a lot of different stories intertwining, and they have a social agenda. They mean to show the dignity of people in the lower classes, usually. They have an ideological agenda in that they want to uh, uh, propose in indirectly a social reform, a political reform, whereby human and political rights should be restored on, on the individuals that inhabit uh, the, the lower classes of society and exactly those that are disempowered, disenfranchised in uh, those society. They all uh, want to propose a more complex idea of a society where talent 
is properly recognized, where education allows people from the lower classes to gain more dignity and therefore become worthy of having more power, decisional power in society. As far as periodicals and journals, two, interestingly, two areas where you see uh, the most success for these periodicals are self-education, that is to say you read a journal to make up for the education you didn't receive in the system because knowledge, be, in, in the popular perception, knowledge is the ladder to social mobility. Without knowledge, you cannot uh, get uh, far in society, become better, better yourself, and become wealthier or more powerful. The other area of success for periodical publications and journals is mobility, meaning especially travel. So you read books about travel and transportation is a big part of society, the industrial society, and also the human experience, the social experience. Interestingly, in reference to self-education, there is an industry, a complete industry, especially in countries such as uh, England, of, of lectures. Private lectures where you pay a ticket to listen to someone who will educate you about anything. It could be health. A lot of health gurus, self-proclaimed doctors or experts of medicine who will tell you what the best diet is or how to... Uh, use natural remedies or how to understand the uh, biology uh, of, of your body in order to improve your health and from there to anything else how to become a writer or how to appreciate the arts etc but it is an industry because people are uh, uh, gathering to hear presenters Presenters are touring a country such as England, and there are people who live off of this the same way that a YouTuber today might live off of the ads because hundreds of thousands or millions of people are tuning in to watch their videos. But the first manifestations of this popular tendency are to be found here where people move from town to town. Their uh, presentation, their lecture is advertised publicly and people come in and pay a ticket and of course then those same people will buy the books published by some of these presenters because the assumption is this knowledge that I receive can be monetized. My life can improve in ways that will allow me uh, to become better. As I said, there are many practical areas. They might teach gardening so that you learn how even if you have a small plot of land, even if you have just a few yards of soil around your house, you can plant some vegetables there and save money, have uh, healthier food, uh, etc. So there are all kinds but it's of, of areas for these lectures, but it's always applied knowledge. It's, it's rarely just um, an intellectual, higher level kind of abstract endeavor. It could be about hypnosis. Uh, the, the list is endless, but you, the, the, the overall attitude about knowledge has changed and is going into the direction of what will be now within a, a space such as YouTube, right? A lot of the phenomena we see today are rooted in the 19th century. Without an understanding of that, everything that you see today seems surprising or even puzzling. Exhibitions and fairs, world fairs, become a big thing uh, around the middle of the 19th century and will, be co will continue to be so, especially until the end of the 20th century. And then from the 1970s on, there is a bit of, of declining, even though just recently in Dubai, there was a World Fair, which was postponed because of COVID and uh, basically ruined uh, by uh, the pandemic, but is still uh, the the, surviving the lingering uh, expression of this phenomenon. Industrial fairs happen, again, first in Great Britain because industrialization takes hold there first, but then also in France, in, uh, uh, in Italy, in other countries as well. So the fairs are a place where you showcase science, especially 
uh, applied science, but then any kind of knowledge, including ex exotic knowledge, anthropologic knowledge, these fairs are also the place where oftentimes people will go and see exemplars, human specimens of other races. So at, at a 19th century uh, fair, you might see pygmies from Africa. And there are individuals from Africa who travel from fair to fair. You might find Native Americans. And they will have a display, a human display. Think of a museum such as those you find in the city with humans instead of mannequins, right? So you might enter an area or a pavilion where tribesmen from a developing country will start a fire, will uh, uh, perform some artisanal craft uh, activities in front of a paying public. But the understanding is that whatever you find there in terms of knowledge is somewhat strategically uh, relevant. And even when you find people from Africa or people from the North Pole in which being displayed, that is all part of the colonial enterprise and furthers the understanding of what colonial expansionism is. What are the moral and psychological, uh, anthropological foundation of that expansion, right? So it's not pure knowledge, it's knowledge that is being bent to the needs of politics, of imperialism, of economic expansion. So that's why I'm saying all of this Makes, makes us really understand why at some point we have the knowledge industry. It's a convergence that takes place through at least 250 years uh, and, and in part even longer. Even the arts that are plenty, uh, there are plenty of artistic uh, expressions represented in these fairs are all socially sanctioned, meaning it's the arts that support as a form of indirect propaganda, the growth of society. So once again, it's not the art as a pure form, but art as a part of knowledge that may have an impact on the mechanisms of growth in society. Okay, so it's usually the art that celebrates the technology. And that's how during the 19th century, you have a lot of paintings or sculptures devoted to the technologies. And, and we'll see, you'll see later on in this some um, links, for example, to the many representation of train stations, of the trains themselves, of, of the ships in the arts. And those are the arts that are emphasized in the context of these industrial affairs. So everything has to converge to the idea that growth, economic growth means that political power also is the priority in, or should be the priority in any uh, society. Uh, the first famous uh, exhibition of the century is the uh, great exhibition of the industry of all nations in a, a specifically built palace, which was similar to Javis, really, in, in, in that it was metal and, and glass, right? If you've ever been to Javits, which is the place the Javits Center in uh, New York for similar fairs for the auto show, but also for fairs of technology, furniture, uh, etc. The Crystal Palace was built. It was you. You can click and, and see the pictures. I can show you a picture right now. Perhaps um, you see the front of this building, all made of metal and glass, was two thousand feet wide, right and uh, it was tens of feet uh, tall. So from the very beginning, you see the approach to the treatment of the fair, that everything is made to shock the viewer into being captivated and attracted into this experience. You don't want to miss the experience of something that was created specifically that is so uh, big that nothing of the sort ever existed before. And then the idea for, for these fairs is that these structures should be temporary and this to be dismantled afterwards. 
And then they often realize that uh, the structures themselves are a big part of the attraction, and so instead of dismantling them, they're kept in place. For example, the Crystal Palace remained for almost 100 years and then was destroyed by fire in 1936. But the other most famous temporary structure is, of course, the Eiffel Tower, right, which was, was made for a fair in, in Paris in the 1880s. And this, you know how the Eiffel Tower is built, with metal bars uh, hold, held together by, um, by, by different, different screws, and was not supposed to be long-lasting. It was kept in place because it became so famous in it became part of the identity of the city. But to this day, in order to maintain the Eiffel Tower, they have to replace the metal bars uh, once they see uh, metal fatigue. So the tower you see today uh, it is not, well, has the same shape, but the metal in it is not the same metal that was put in it by the en en engineer uh, named uh, Eiffel that gave the name to it. And it came after the revolution of 1498, of 1848. Uh, and those revolutions were so powerful in the imagination of people that, for example, in Italian, which is my primary language, you still say un quarantotto, a 48, to indicate a big mess, a big chaos, a state of confusion. But it came after this revolution, meaning that it was an attempt to normalize change, right? To celebrate change, because instead the revolution called for uh, addressing some of the issues caused by the industri Industrial Revolution. It had six million visitors, which was an incredible thing, but it tells you of a massified culture, big urban areas, millions of people living in London, and those millions go to the same place. For the first time, you found public toilets in a public place, uh, and you had to pay a penny. Uh, and after this, public toilets were installed permanently in London and in other metropolitan areas. As I said, the attempt was to shock, to cause big surprise, uh, uh, astonishment, amazement, right? And then once you pull the viewers in with the shock, right? And, and again, the mechanisms are the same, right? Even if you talk about how you pull people into seeing a YouTube video, more or less it's the same thing, some kind of shock through the picture, through the title, and then you pull people in to educate or inform them. And in this case, it's also part of the propaganda of the new changes. So it's a celebration of the new technologies of growth, economic, colonialistic growth, right? And progress is the keyword, is the theme, and knowledge is subordinated to uh, progress, meaning knowledge that leads to progress in society is emphasized over pure knowledge, and that is part of the convergence that will continue and culminate in our knowledge industry. These are a couple of exhibitions that took place in the United States, in Philadelphia, 100 years after the Declaration of Independence, and in uh, Chicago, Paris had several. Uh, in 1889, the Eiffel Tower was built. There was a World Fair. It shouldn't be World. It should be World Fair. Let me fix this right away. That's it. You see how simple it is to interact with the uh, web when, when you have these apps. Okay. And in terms, of course, of revolutions, electricity was the beginning of yet another revolution that started at the end of the 18th century, but the fruits, the, the, the consequences were not felt until the end of the 1800s, right? It took another 100, 150 years. And it's particularly relevant to us because electricity is the basis for the digital revolution, right? And at the same time, electricity being a form of energy that is fluid and constant, a stream of energy, it was seen as from the beginning as the proper model or metaphor for progress itself, being a constant, right? Because think about it, we are obsessed with progress and growth, right? You yourselves 
will probably end up, most of you, working in some kind, and it doesn't matter whether it's a service industry, whether it's the uh, health, uh, service, uh, health service industry, or a, a commercial venture, you'll find yourself in an environment where growth is the only possibility, the only option, right? The only goal. And you, you'll have to sit at meetings where plans are made and you'll have to work for, uh, to, to generate growth. And it seems like if your company will not grow by three, by five, by 10, by 20%, then you're failing. You are failing, the company is failing, uh, etc. Where does that come from? It is not like that in the uh, societies and cultures of the past, but it's a constant in the culture of modernity. Walter, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, again, I'll, I'll have Franklin, uh, worked on electricity. You know some of the experiments. You might have studied them in school. Alessandro Volta made progress on towards the creation of uh, batteries, right? And electricity first was applied to the telegraph. And, and there is a whole section in the book about it. And then it was applied to illumination with the creation of the electric bulb. But then, of course, in order for electricity to be provided, you need a, an infrastructure that requires private and public investments, right? And electrification initially was indeed a public effort. And this dynamics, this interaction, this complex interface between private and public continues to this day. Who should be responsible for email? To this day, you find debates about this. Shouldn't the state, the United States government, provide a platform for email, guarantee the privacy of individuals instead of leaving it in the hands of Google with Gmail or Microsoft with Outlook. You still find these debates to this day, right? Whether or not the public, public agencies or the, gov the government should provide certain kind of platforms or infrastructure instead of the private sector. Chapter five, as you find in this quote, is about new communications devices which prepare the way for what is being called the media revolution of the 20th century. And it starts with the trains, because trains provide a network on which information and knowledge is traveling, and the network itself, the existence of this technology affects knowledge altogether, the perception of what the world is, space, time, but also what the human experience is like. Because what is one of the features, the mental psychological features of our modern or ultra postmodern culture? It's a kind of nomadism, right? Not being rooted in one place or one community, being in transit, being constantly in transit, not being permanently in one place. And this idea starts with the train. Uh, this, this expectation that it is an improved state of experience of life being in transit, not just focusing on the destination, but moving, cost, being constantly on the move. The existence of a network of railroads uh, creates the basis for increased traveling increased migrations, right? And industrialization relies on, on this, right? You, you have a need which is localized because you have uh, industrial infrastructure and then you need to attract laborers because soon enough, you, you don't have enough people in the area to support the growth of that industry. More importantly, tourists. And the book follows uh, the mindset of the tourists a lot now, it's not like travel was ignored by previous generations and previous society, but travel, uh, uh, not traveling for, for commerce, not traveling for a political mission, a diplomatic mission, was accessible only to a very small number of people. And now it trains the threshold for traveling extensively is lower to the point where even the middle classes, not the lower classes in a very restricted way with a limited 
uh, area of travel. But in terms of extensive travel, in traveling from, let's say, England to Italy, from Italy to Russia or Turkey, that becomes accessible even to the upper middle classes, and at some point the middle classes themselves. So you have a much larger number of people that can embrace travel as a modality. Again, it's not about the destination. It's about travel as a new condition, right? And part of your social identity, because who are you really if you cannot claim that you've seen the world? And that uh, really uh, is, is easy to understand for us because it is the same for us, right? If you find someone who has not traveled, if you find someone who's never been outside of Long Island, you would be immensely surprised, right? And you would want to inquire why this person has never traveled, has never ventured outside of Suffolk County or Suffolk and NASA, right? Because you have absorbed this expectation. You have integrated it in your view of life. That part of life, that one of the basic preconditions to a full existence is to travel. Not to be in a specific place, but to travel in general, okay? And time and space are influenced by this. The book mentions an article from Macmillan's magazine, and Macmillan was a publishing in the house involved in the production of guides, travel books, etc. And the quote that you find here, there are a couple of quotes that are interesting. We are now infinitely more familiar than our forefathers were with the idea of the limited dimensions of the Earth, a tiny ball axle eight to 8,000 uh, miles, meaning the uh, global village is being established, the world is much smaller because you can reach uh, uh, any destination much more quickly with the train, that's the assumption. A well-known use of travel consists in the self-reliance and the general inventiveness which it develops, which speaks to what really I was saying before, that traveling is a condition that is not the time you spend in between places, but it is a condition of living. It is nomadism. These two lines are about nomadism, about the nomadic uh, understanding of uh, life. And because of this, you find a lot of media, an entire media industry, revolving, being supported, being fueled by travel itself. You have no idea how successful all publications related to travel were in the 19th century. The number of journals and magazines, the copies, the number of copies they sold, even people who did not travel or could not travel. You find people in the mountains of Tuscany. I found evidence that peasants in the mountains of Tuscany at the end of the, in the 1870s and 80s were reading travel magazines. They themselves could not travel, but they traveled vicariously because they felt diminished without it, because even they got the message that travel was one of the essential dimensions of living. Therefore, if I cannot travel, then I read this illustrated magazine, first with illustrations, then with pictures, to make up for it, right? So you have travel books, you have the guidebooks, the, the two most famous commercial companies publishing guidebooks to all the countries in the world are Murray, John Murray, and Bedecker, uh, both in English, Bedecker was, was a German, but the, the guides are sold mostly in English. And then there are also books about travel. For the first time, there are plenty of popular novels that are about travel. And then, of course, you need to print the timetables of trains and boats, the schedules, right? And you find a section in the magazines or the newspapers about trains and ships and because you have a network, then knowledge can be incorporated in this network. And therefore, at every train station in the past, you would have found at least one bookstore. And this continued to be the case until the 20th century. To this day, uh, a lot of train stations will have a place where you can purchase a book. And the same is true for airport. It was a given up until the 20th century that each tr major train station in Europe would have a big bookstore where you could buy books. You have, of course, 
repercussions on the language, right? Missing the train as a metaphor for missing on uh, the, the opportunities of life because of this technology, and there are many other examples. And you have a reaction, of course. I've mentioned, this is not in the book, it's part of my own research. I've mentioned Maurice Hewlett, author of historical novels and travel books, and he's wrote in Tuscany from 1904, reprinted 32 times in, in five years. Again, travel books could be best-selling books during this period. What is his position about the railroad? Negative, but it is negative exactly because the train has been emphasized so much. So the criticism is a reflection of the success of the technology. It says, well, wherever you find the train, wherever the train, there is a train station, then the pristine culture, the past, the patina of the past world has disappeared. And because of the train, because you can travel by train from England to Tuscany, then the whole world is being homogenized. And he says, if I go to the countryside in England, if I go to the countryside in France, I cannot find a peasant who's not a citizen of the world. Because even the peasant from those rural areas is somewhat influenced, connected, influenced by the global culture. And then he abandons Hewlett himself. He claims he has abandoned the areas uh, that are crisscrossed by the railroads to find the few places uh, like those islands in the, in the novels from this period where dinosaurs can still be found and, uh, and, and Neanderthals can still be found. He's traveling to find the little village where global culture has not arrived yet, where people are still doing the same thing they used to do hundreds of, or thousands of years ago. And in fact, uh, it's not only Hewlett, there is another book that I've written about by Lucy Baxter, uh, it's called um, uh, a nook beneath the chestnuts. And ba Lucy Baxter, who was a, an English woman who married an American and they lived in Florence in the 1870s, she went to a village in the Tuscan Apennines that was outside of the, the network of industrial uh, production, transportation, etc. And she focuses on a very small hamlet. Hamlet, technically, in, in British English, is less than a village, smaller than a village, with only nine families. And she observes them, and she studies them, and she comes to the conclusion that they live the same kind of life their ancestors lived 500 or 2,000 years before. And her hypothesis, her anthropological model, is that these people have not been affected by globalization, in any way, shape, or form, and therefore they're still repeating the same practices their Etruscan ancestors were doing 2,000 years earlier. And he proves that, provides a material evidence with illustrations. For example, he'll say, this is a pot used by a woman in the village to make polenta. And this is a pot that, I, that you can find in a museum in Rome or Naples uh, and this is a 2,000-year-old pot, it's just the same. This is how uh, Roman workers uh, transported stones to build the bridge. This is how the locals, when we were there during that summer, built a bridge, and you can see the same techniques are being used, using illustrations from vases and illustrations she made of scenes from that village. So the assumption is that the train is really a vessel for knowledge. Wherever the train uh, uh, is, is wherever, uh, whenever a place can be reached by train, then global culture uh, spreads the poison. It's a poison for, for Hewlett because it changes whatever existed before and makes everything the same, creates the same mindset. Uh, in every area, destroys any evidence of past cultures, of uh, past ethnic groups, okay? So you see, you, you have an understanding of the reasons why the train is included in this discussion about media and knowledge, okay? And here you have a series of incredible works of art devoted 
to uh, the, the train, we can quickly look at some of them. Turner was a famous American painter, and this is an incredible picture. You, you, you cannot see, oh, let me see if you can make it, okay. There it is, and, and you have the smoke, the fog, and the train emerging in this landscape and coming to dominate this landscape. But it gives you the sense, the sense of the speed of this technology, and also the, sen the sense that everything else is being obliterated, is being overwhelmed by the train <coughs> itself. The landscape disappears, right? The train is the protagonist. The speed of the train is the new modality of existence. It doesn't matter where you are. It's not the surrounding landscape when you're on the train that dominates your experience is speed itself, or depending on the kind of literature that you want to connect this to, the experience of the landscape is not the same if you're on a train, as opposed to being on a carriage or being on foot. So the technology drives your experience. And again, this kind of discourse is the same whether you're talking about this painting or the social media now, right? Our digital culture drives how we interface with other people, with society, with the space or the territory we inhabit. Just the same, just an extension of the same kind, the same line of reasoning. And in here you find a page from Wikipedia because Monet, Claude Monet, who was one of the most famous impressionist paintings of France, devoted a whole series, a whole series of paintings just to train stations, right? This is one, um, trying to find one that is more famous. Yeah, this one, for example, it's even better, right? So the technology itself and the infrastructure of the technology becomes the focus, becomes the theme, right? Because the technology is not the instrument we avail ourselves of in order to have experiences. It is the central experience, right? The same way that you could say, watch, spending time watching YouTube is not about those videos, it's about YouTube being a space in your life that you inhabit, right? It's not like you're using those videos to then go out and do things, not really. And the final example is a British painter. This is one of the versions. There are two, at least two different versions of this uh, painting. And this is a, a train station in England where you can see the train in the background, but this time you find a lot of people, but what is the dynamic in the painting is that the technology is reshaping society. People, their roles, their place in society is being determined by their interaction with the technology, where the train itself becomes an extension of the social community. It becomes a place where you find different classes. And of course, you find classes on a train, right? Third class, second class, first class, depending on uh, the kind of ticket you purchase. And society does not exist in a pure form. Society exists as uh, customers for this technology and their interaction with the technology reshapes their roles and determines different interactions and then you can study what they're doing uh, individually and the various scenes and the various social classes that are being represented in here. <laughs>